Hey, everybody. Hi. How are you guys doing? I see this. This is awesome. Um, good to see a, a, a number of people from different places. I recognize so from Nepal, from the United States, uh, from yeah. Marcy, you're in Brazil, right? And from elsewhere. Um, I think Ana, Ana Espinosa is in, um, is in Mexico. Um, Chirunim is in Nigeria. Um, we have a few people from the United States and others joining from, um, from places we don't know as yet, but, um, but we, will, um, we will be starting in a moment. We're just waiting for people to join us here and um, glad that's, that many of you are joining um, as we were urging you, joining as, as actual groups, <clears throat> groups of people, uh, family um, uh, in many, in most of your cases. Um, so I am going to briefly get started. I just want to give you a sense uh, of, of what's going on, but I'm going to talk for a little while. Um, and then we're going to have uh, a few speakers. We'll have um, Bahira Trask, who is um, a professor of, um, I think, is she on this call yet? I don't know if she is, um, uh, but she will be calling in um, from, um, uh, from uh, Delaware in the United States, um, and she will be giving us a sense of global trends. Uh, and then we will have a couple of families actually speak. Um, one from India, one from uh, the United States, um, to give some perspective. And then afterwards, um, uh, if um, afterwards we will engage in this open dialogue. So um, let me share my screen, if you would, and I'm going to get us started. Um, So, um, so welcome everybody. So this is, uh, I, I'm gonna give you an initial kind of presentation for some, them, some of you are not entirely familiar with Learning Life. I'll give you some sense of what we do. So I'm gonna run through a lot of information um, and, uh, uh, and I don't expect you to get all of it, but the idea is for you to get um, some things about, about us, which will help you. Um, and then I will also be giving some preliminary remarks for the, um, for the, the, uh, the dialogue. So my name is Paul Lachelier. I'm the founder and the director of Learning Life. And um, to give you some sense of uh, Learning Life, um, and by the way, while I go through this, please um, use the chat, uh, the Zoom chat to introduce yourself and your family. Um, uh, in, you know, indicate what city and what country you're from first, and then you, the names of the people um, that are with you on, uh, on the, in this dialogue. Um, so we are an educational nonprofit based in Washington, D.C. in the United States. We were founded in 2012. Our mission is to spread learning in everyday life outside school walls, right? Um, the idea is to try to encourage learning in everyday life, uh, not just in school, because uh, learning should be a part of, uh, a central part of our lives. So we have three programs um, that are really best understood as learning communities. Um, so learning communities are places where people socialize and learn together and get to know each other. Um, so our family diplomacy initiative, which you guys are all part of, is the, is the first thing. Um, and it is our flagship program. It's our, it's our biggest program. Uh, we also have an international mentoring program for younger um, people to help open the world to people from, to, to younger people, especially people from lower income families. And then we do these democracy dinners here um, in uh, the Metro Washington DC area. Uh, I'm gonna focus more on our family diplomacy initiative because that's the topic of this conversation and, um, and uh, of, of this program more generally. Um, so the family diplomacy initiative, the broad vision that we have for the future is that in every family, there would be at least one family diplomat. Um, and that those, or FD, and uh, each of those family diplomats would be advocating for the concerns, the needs, and the aspirations of families 
through nonprofits, businesses, and governments in order to try to create a more caring and connected world. So that's the vision, right? That's where we want to go. Our goals more specifically are to try to nurture more caring, capable, connected global citizens, but also to empower families to participate in governance. What that means is to participate in decision making that affects families' lives in businesses, in nonprofits, in governments at local to international levels. Um, our current activities are two things. We um, engage in dialogues live via Zoom uh, with families worldwide. So this is the first of six dialogues we're doing this year, one per month from June to November. And we also connect, and many of you are in fact connected via Facebook, and that helps us to keep us connected between those dialogues and to learn from each other through family introductions. You've, many of you have introduced your families um, and uh, through interaction, um, and we post things about families happening across the world. So a little bit about our past, our present, and our future. Um, first, we were launched in 2016. We, meaning the FDI, the Family Diplomacy Initiative, was launched in 2016. In 2017, we did a small project, uh, community photos, where families across, well, um, in the United States, El Salvador, Senegal, and Jordan, were sharing photos of their respective communities. In 2018 and 19, we did a first food culture project. Everybody loves food, or most people love food, and food is actually a really interesting lens through which you can explore culture and both commonalities and differences. So that project involved, uh, again, 24 families in the United States, uh, El Salvador and Senegal. Then importantly, in 2020, we began to scale up. We began to grow our, our program, this uh, family diplomacy initiative. And we did this through Facebook. Um, and so that second project in food culture involves 60 family members across the world in 35 different countries. This year, we are focusing on family safety and health. That's in part because of the coronavirus pandemic, but also because family safety and health is a fundamental question of concern to everybody. Right. So we have um, we're expecting um, 150 or more family members to be participating from over 40 countries over the course of these six live international dialogues from June through uh, through November. The, the growth in the Facebook group has been rather large and in part because of a young a team of uh, family diplomacy ambassadors. These are young people from across the world who are reaching out to Facebook groups all over um, uh, Facebook and all over the world and inviting people to join the Facebook group, our FDI Facebook group. And so we started in June 2019 with just uh, about 200 people. In June of 2020, 600 people, so we had tripled, and now we have um, uh, over 5,000 people. So we're growing by between 20 and 45 uh, new members of the Family Diplomacy Initiative per day coming from across the world. So we're growing very rapidly. Now, in terms of phases of development, I'm going to briefly tell you, right now we are in phase one of uh, the Family Diplomacy Initiative, where families are connecting with each other through these dialogues, through Facebook, and learning about each other. Phase two is when we identify families that are willing to serve as family diplomats. And we begin to train those families to become active fam citizen diplomats, advocating for the needs, the concerns, and the aspirations of their families and other families across the world. Okay, so it's the, begin the process of beginning to empower families. The third phase happens really in the, in the future. In five, 10 uh, years, we expect to begin to represent, have these family diplomats represented in businesses and governments and in nonprofit organizations to help to advocate for the needs, the concerns, and the aspirations of families. So that gives you kind of a long view of where we're, where we're going. Okay, so funner stuff here. I'm going to give you um, some photos of uh, previous dialogues to give you a sense of our, our history and uh, up until uh, the near present. So you might recognize me. Um, this was, uh, uh, I think, about um, five years ago. Um, uh, this is uh, my mentee in the center. 
Um, his name is James. He is now 15 years old, um, but this is his family. Um, and he is still involved in, um, in, our, in our programming and he occasionally participates in, in various parts of our, our programming. But these, this is one of the original families that participated in the early dialogues um, uh, that we began. This is another family from El Salvador that participated in some of the early dialogues and another family from Senegal um, and a family from Jordan for these early dialogues that we did. Now, in when we started out, we literally were going to people's homes in the United States and setting up a screen, or we were going into libraries and setting up this big screen and then having these dialogues. In this case, this is a family here in the United States talking to four families in El Salvador. Then uh, this is a, a, a group of families in the United States talking to one family in, in Senegal. This was um, the dialogue that we did last year with uh, um, a group of um, families and individuals um, focused on food culture. It was only one dialogue last year that we did, but then we did a lot of interaction on Facebook. This year we're doing more dialogues, six dialogues instead of one, and less interaction on Facebook, but you'll see some interaction on Facebook uh, uh, between the dialogues. So. Um, let me give you a little detail about these, uh, the, the, um, the dialogues um, uh, for this, uh, this year. Um, so first of all, each of these dialogues, each of the six dialogues are an hour and a half. We're going to have one to two experts talk to give some um, sense of background to inform our discussion. And then two to three families will speak. Um, uh, and then we'll have an open dialogue in which each of you can participate. Um, and I just want to emphasize that you'll be able to participate with your voice, but also you, whenever you want, you can participate with comments and questions via chat, the, the Zoom chat. Um, to uh, the overarching question for these, all of six of the dialogues is what do families worldwide need to be safe and healthy? Um, and the topics will vary from one dialogue to the next. So we're not talking exactly about the same thing. Although, of course, in these dialogues, things are going to are going to look uh, um, where some things are going to uh, are going to recur. We're going to talk about certain things again and again, but other things will come up that are new in part because of new participants and then just new thoughts. Um, today, though, we're focusing on global trends in family life to give some context to this uh, um, to the to the dialogues. So when we're talking about global trends in family, there are a couple of, um, there's a question we want to ask, which is basically how are families changing worldwide and how does this impact health of, of, and security of families? And so we might get into global patterns and trends in family demographics, parenting, childhood, family life, aspirations, viewpoints, et cetera. It's really up to you um, in part to determine what we'll be talking about. So I'm providing some background and I will then launch into and give you, I'll probably embarrass my family, some of whom are here because I'm gonna be talking about my, uh, my family. Um, uh, and then we'll, we'll, um, we'll get into, we'll get into the, some details. Um, Bahida Trask, as I mentioned, is a professor in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies. She's a specialist on families um, uh, and what's happening to families across the world. Um, and she sits on the board of advisors for Learning Life. Um, Joseph Tolls, um, uh, and, and Debjani, I'm sorry if she's on this call. I forgot to add that she is a, um, she is a vice principal um, at a school in India, but Joseph Tolls is a retired school counselor um, and lives in Alabama uh, in the United States. Um, uh, and he's a father. So we'll have a, the perspectives of a father and a mother. Um, and so I am going to um, give you some dialogue notes and guidelines, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about my family and how that relates to the, the, um, the wider world and what's happening family trends. Um, so first of all, we are video recording and we're going to be photographing this dialogue, both to report what's going on and to promote what's going on. Um, so hopefully you are comfortable with that. Um, uh, secondly, um, please, as I mentioned, use the Zoom, Zoom chat to introduce your, yourself and your family. Please indicate your city, your country, your names, and whatever else you would like to, um, to share about your family. Um, keep yourself muted 
during the dialogue when you're not talking so that we can have uh, um, clear, everybody can hear clearly. Uh, be respectful even when you disagree and seek to learn rather than try to win an argument, right? So we're here really to learn more than anything else. Okay, so some thoughts about today's dialogue. I can't find a, <laughs> so by the way, this is my partner, Kelly, to my, to my uh, left, I guess to your right, I don't know. And this is her son, Kieran, um, uh, to, um, to her right. He's very tall, um, 17 years old. I feel very short next to him. <laughs> um, and uh, this is my family full of short people. Um, and, um, and so this photo, unfortunately, is probably the most recent photo that we have of our family, like as, as many of our family members as possible. Who's missing here is um, my brother Philip's uh, wife, Lorraine, and our mother, um, uh, who's actually in on this call, uh, Anna Lachelier. But here is my father. Um, that's the old bald guy right here. Um, <laughs> Um, and he's in on this call as well. Um, my sister, Suzanne, uh, my niece, um, Shauna, my niece, Olivia, her daughter, uh, my brother, David, his wife and his child. Um, so I'm introducing you to them in part because I wanna tell you something about what's happening in our family over two generations and how that connects to what's happening across the world. So I am probably going to uh, probably reveal too much information here, but nonetheless, it's important information to understand, to understand what's going on to families across the world. First, um, my parents had four kids, uh, myself, I'm the youngest, and then uh, my sister and two older brothers. Um, and then they got divorced, I think, 28 or 30 years after, after their marriage. Now, in the second generation, in these four other bullet points, you have what's happening in our generation. My oldest brother has the most kids. He has two kids and he's, and he's still married. My older brother, David, got divorced, got remarried, and then had one child. My sister is unmarried, no kids. I am divorced, no kids. So what does this mean in terms of the future of families? Um, and I want to give some kind of broader, broader uh, uh, perspective here and tie what's happening. First of all, families across the world are shrinking. Um, uh, they're becoming more diverse and they're becoming smaller. And that's very important to keep in mind because it has big implications for the health and the, uh, the, the health of families across the world to some extent. But we can get into those details and figure that out. Well, how does family size connect to, to, to health? Um, secondly, at the same time, our world is becoming more interdependent, which is part of the reason why we need to be talking to each other across borders. And when I mean across borders, I don't just mean across national borders. I mean across uh, 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 lines of race, lines of class, lines of um, religion, et cetera, and so forth, to know what's going on in the world and to understand each other's perspectives because we're becoming more interdependent. A car is made, and I'm just giving you some examples, from parts from different all over the world. One car could have parts from China, from Bangladesh, from the United States, from Japan, et cetera, and so forth. The clothes we get oftentimes are made in other parts of the world. Disease, as we know, in this time of COVID is tying us together. And it very much has to do with airplane uh, uh, transportation, which helped to spread the disease, right? Uh, and of course, immigration. Many of us are immigrants. I was born in France and my family moved to the United States. So we are in some sense immigrants to the, the United States. And a lot of people across the world are migrating. OK, so there are various ways in which we're becoming more interdependent and more intertwined. And hence why we need to talk to each other and learn about what's going on in families. The one of the reasons why people are having fewer kids is because the cost of raising children is going up. And part of the reason why the cost of raising children is going up is because our kids are getting, we're investing more in our kids. That's a good thing. Our kids are getting more and more educated. When I look at the surveys that you guys have been filling out um, in different parts of the world, I see that your parents have less, much less education. Oftentimes, the you, uh, many of you have a lot more education than your parents. That is a growing trend across the world. But it does mean that we that 
childhood is lasting longer as people get more education and, um, and it's, it's increasing the cost of, of children. Um, uh, and that's part of the reason why people are having fewer children. At the same time, governments are not supporting families the way they could be. They're not providing childcare. Um, uh, they're not providing early education starting from, from early childhood, even though there's growing science that shows that early education is very important for children. We aren't providing, and many, many times, uh, many families across the world do not have, have health insurance to take care of themselves and their families. And we don't have paid parental leave so that parents can um, take time off of work in order to take care of their families. At the same time, across the world, people are becoming more individualistic and less collectivistic. What that means is we are trying to pursue our own happiness, our own happiness as individuals. That's not necessarily a bad thing, right? It means that we're, we, in some sense, we're happier in some ways because we're pursuing our own desires and our own goals. But at the same time, it's in some sense threatening families because each person wants to do their own thing. Um, and so, and so it, it may be accounting for the increase in divorce and the increasing fragmentation of families and the, the shrinking size of families as well. Okay, I'm going to stop here. And uh, we are going to, we are going to um, move back. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing. And um, Bahir, I'm hoping Bahira Trask is with us. And if she's not, yes, perfect. Um, so Bahira, do you want to introduce um, who you're with and introduce yourself and you are next. And then we will have um, Joseph Tolls speak. And, um, and I'm hoping that um, uh, Debjani is with us from India. Or is hope. She might be on the second page. Yeah, she might be on the second page, so. Okay, um, Bahira. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you for inviting me. And it's lovely to see so many of you from all around the world. I am in Delaware, actually on the border of Delaware and Pennsylvania. I'm Bahira Trask, and this is my daughter, Julia. And since Paul introduced himself, I will introduce myself as well. I was married, I'm divorced, and I have 14 year old twins. So, <laughs> and I have a German father and Egyptian, uh, I mean, an Egyptian father and a German mother. And I grew up in America speaking German at home. So very multicultural. Mm -hmm. That probably led me to my studies. I am, my PhD is in cultural anthropology. And I have spent my whole professional career studying family change in Western and non-Western societies. So I have a lot of thoughts on it. Paul asked me to prepare a somewhat formal presentation. I have done that, but I am more than happy to answer questions. I want to get us going just to be thinking a little bit about these issues, and then we can have an informal discussion. My daughter, Julia, sometimes comes to my classes. And she has a lot of opinions <laughs> on these topics, so you can ask her questions, too, about what we're going to talk about. I'm going to share my screen, so hold on, let's see. Can you see my screen? Yeah, you good? Okay. All right. I want to, I, I do a lot of work besides my academic work. I actually do a lot of work with the United Nations and I have been working with them over the last 11 years now. They have a, a unit within the United States, within the United Nations called the focal point on the family. And what they try to do is advocate for families. And so my work has been around that because so many of our programs these days are very much focused on individuals, our social programs, political programs, economic programs, or they focus on distinct groups like on young children or on the elderly, but we, we're, we're losing the family perspective. And I think this is a huge mistake and is leading to many problems on multiple levels. And I'll get more into that. I would like to start with a statement by the former UN Secretary uh, Antonio Guterres, who said in 2018, the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals, these are goals that all countries in the world have subscribed to, depends on how well families are empowered to contribute to the achievement of those goals. Thus, 
policies focusing on the well-being of families are certain to benefit development. This is extremely important because we need the units, however they are defined, advocating because they're the ones where decisions are made. So why do families still matter? Well, they matter in a lot of different ways. You know, they've been, ex uh, I teach a lot of classes about this and I always talk about this. Historically, there have been experiments to raise children in other settings, in communal settings, in kibbutzes. All of those have failed. In the end, if you look around the world, children are raised in families, however they're defined. And families are where you get your initial sense of who you are, your social identity and your individual identity. Families provide basic supports, shelter, safety, but also economic support. And one of the problems I see in a lot of research is that we forget the economic nature of families, especially in non-Western parts of the world, and especially often for low-income people, where everybody's working together. It's not necessarily my income is just for myself. And I actually argue that even in the West, even among very well-to-do people, I am not, for example, going to take a job in California without consulting with all the people who I consider family. I'm not going to make a decision without involving my partner or my children. So there's actually a lot more group work going on than we often realize. Um, also, care is an incredibly important part of families. These days, we tend to focus a lot on early childhood, Early childhood is super important, but families still provide care for all the vulnerable individuals. When somebody becomes ill, when somebody has a disability, for frail elderly, families are still the main place where this caring takes place. And often this care is very gendered. So for example, in the United States, young men these days are pretty much expected to help when people have children. That is now kind of the thing. But when you look at care across the spectrum, women tend to do most of that care and it's unpaid work on top of paid work. So that's a big issues that families are dealing with. Also, as I just said, family economics are very, very important. So when families are under extreme economic stress, which more and more families around the world are because we have increasing inequality, it leads to other types of family issues and problems. Paul mentioned individualism as leading to fragmentation in families. That is in part true, but the other part is economic stress. There's a lot of research that, for example, when someone in the family loses their job, when the income is reduced in the family, then people start fighting with each other. And it makes it very difficult to sustain family life. And all of this conflict is very, very bad for the mental health of the children. So there are many repercussions that come out of extreme economic stress. And there's now a lot of, Paul was talking about families and health. There are, there are many, many studies that show that when people live in poverty, and especially when children live in poverty, it has long-term health effects. For example, uh, uh, poor children often have many more cases of asthma because they live in areas that are more polluted. Their households have more chemicals in them all of that sort of thing. So all of these issues are interconnected with each other. I want to give you just a couple of global trends. And again, we can talk more about them informally. Paul already mentioned a couple, but around the world, except for in Sub-Saharan Africa, fertility is decreasing. So women are having fewer and fewer children. This is good and bad. In fact, in Europe, we now have countries like Italy, France, Spain, where women are having, we're at zero, where there's zero. In order for a society to duplicate, it needs for every woman to have 2.1 children. And that's not happening anymore in the Western world uh, and in Japan also. This is very problematic because you don't have enough people working and who's gonna care for all the elderly people? and you don't have enough consumers for all the stuff that's being produced. So what is happening is 
it used to look, the global population used to look like a pyramid. You had a lot of children being born and then a few elderly. Now we've moved towards a, rec a rectangle. And in some places, there's actually now more elderly people than children being born. This is a first in human history. We don't even know how that's going to play out. Another major phenomenon, especially in the West, is the increase in babies being born outside of the clock. I can still remember when I was in high school that it was considered very sh shameful to have a child outside of marriage. Now in the United States, over 40% of all babies are born outside of marriage. It's become a normalized phenomenon. If you think it's good or bad, it, it just is a trend that is happening. We also have that happening in Northern Europe, where in places like Iceland, and I believe in Sweden, it's up to 55%. The other thing that's happening is we're all waiting to get married. I say marriage because we're not waiting to have sex. People have always had sex at around the same age. Some under the umbrella of marriage, other people outside of the umbrella of marriage. But what is happening is the formal union, the legal union is going up and up. In fact, in the Nordic countries, it is now around, I think for women around 30 and for men 33, at, uh, that's the age of first marriage. There are some sociologists who argue that marriage has become more important, not less important. So people expect more from marriage today than they did 50 years ago. So they're spending more time looking for someone who they think is going to be appropriate for them. And there is a very well-known um, sociologist, his name is Andrew Churlin, and he says that what we're looking for these days isn't just a partner and someone who helps pay the bills and you know the things we used to look for in the past. Now we're looking for someone who's going to kind of complete us, who's going to bring out our best side, you know, so who's going to like introduce us to new things that we hadn't even imagined. So what we've done is we we've brought the bar for marriage up instead of lowering. Sometimes I read these things that say people don't want to get married anymore. That's actually not true. People do want to get married, but they want more out of marriage than they did in the past. So what is all this leading to? Well, there's more people who are single around the world and there are more people getting divorced because the divorce rate is primarily actually tied to women in the paid labor force. So as you have more and more women around the world who are economically independent, if they're not happy, they don't stay in a marriage where they have to serve the man or his family or a combination of both. They get out. So that's one of the main drivers around the world, not just in the United States. Also, it's taking us longer to raise our children. <laughs> we invest more in our children. They need more education. Yeah. And so they're financially dependent on us for actually a much longer time than this than was true historically. I have some other here statistics. You, you can see them on my slide. I um, just want to say one thing about migration. About 3% of the global population is currently migrating. That's actually less than previously in history. Previously in history, it was much easier for people to move around the globe. It's easier for us to travel, but what has happened is all of the high income countries have put in place very strict laws that make it very difficult to move from one country to another country especially if you want to bring your family with you. So that's actually put a damper on global mig migration. A couple of other things that I want, to, I already talked about that there are more and more elderly than young people. The prediction is that by 2050, there will be more elderly than young people on this earth. What is happening with that is what they sometimes call beanpole families. So instead of having large extended families like we had historically, we now have more and more generations alive in one in one at uh, one time. So increasingly kids are part of three and four generations. It is not unusual these days for children to know their grandparents and their great grandparents. In the United States, 
around 1900, usually by the time the oldest child left the house, both parents would have died already. So this is another major change. So I just want us to remember that some things are changing, but there are other, it's tied to other changes. So we might have less, fewer people in our immediate quote unquote biological family, but families are not necessarily getting smaller if you take the biology out of it. Because one, people have a lot of people who they now consider family who may not, they may not be related to, and or you can have multiple generations alive at the same time. So these are the kind of changes that are swirling around us. A huge, a huge change is the rise of women in the global labor force. And that's actually where my research has gone because like I said, in, on, on the one hand, it gives women independence. It makes them rethink their relationships. On the other hand, it's exacerbated the issue of care. And care is a huge problem, both in high and low income families. Who is going to take care of the children, the elderly, the disabled, and the terminally ill? And again, culturally, there are a lot of variations in terms of who thinks what is appropriate. The other issue that families are dealing with is that families today are less able to control their economic and social well being than in the past. This is a complex topic, which I can get more into, but it really has to do, it's tied into the issue of economics and globalization, and that more and more people are engaged in what is called vulnerable work, which means it's very easy to lose your job. So, for example, in the United States, for my parents' generation, if you had a job, you had your job for 30 or 40 years, you had a pension when you retired, and you had a lot of security with all kinds of benefits. That is not true anymore. In fact, I've been reading that for millennials, you know, they um, uh, many, many millennials, they are now in jobs for two or three years, and then they switch over to another job, or some people work six months and then don't work six months. It provides flexibility, but it doesn't provide benefits. And this is very important. And so people feel very, very vulnerable. And it makes it very, particularly for young people, very difficult to plan out their lives. How can you take on the responsibility of a partner and children when you don't know what your own economic possibilities are going to be? So why, why, why are we talking about all of these changes? Why have I devoted my career to studying change? Well, because of the next generation, this is a very complicated situation. There are all of these disruptive changes happening also in, in cultures and societies that are considered, quote unquote, much more traditional than a place than the United States. We are an immigration society. There's always a lot of sort of movement in the United States. But these changes I'm talking about, they reach around the globe. And the changes are happening very rapidly. Like I said, in my lifetime, I have seen enormous, enormous social change including this increasing inequality within countries and between countries as well. And the obstacles for young people are growing. So if you are on the quote unquote right side of the equation, which means your parents have some money, you're going to get a great start in life. If you're on the opposite side of the equation, it is more difficult for you. And this is this, they, they are also calling it, for example, the digital divide. You know, if you are sitting in a village in, you know, a far away place, you're going to have a much harder time accessing computers, the internet, and someone like my daughter who has her own computer, her own phone, you know, and is completely connected all over the world with all of her friends. So, so what's happening is that there's a whole group of people that are being left behind. And this is of great concern to me. The issue with this growing divide, especially for young people, the predictions are it's going to lead to social unrest 
because people are aware of these inequalities, yeah, and they're not just going to accept what it is that is going on. So I want just a couple more slides. I didn't. I don't want to go into a whole big lecture about all of these things, but I just want you to be thinking about this, that we tend to think of family as a private entity and people deal with their issues as if these are private concerns. I think this is an incorrect interpretation of what is going on. Families are a public good. Families contribute to the citizenry of their societies. They raise the next generation. I mean, families contribute in a lot of different ways, as I have said. And so we need policies that support families and the challenges which they are facing. So this is a public issue. This is not just a private issue. In general, the policies that do exist, especially in the West, are policies that are usually directed at poor families, yeah? Families that are thought of as not being quote unquote self-reliant. This is not enough. All families need different types of policies that support them. Like I said, work family, for example, is something that everybody is engaged with, everybody is struggling with. So what do we need? Well, we need what um, UNICEF has defined as social protection for families. And UNICEF, in fact, has defined child-conditioned social protection as a basic human right. So this isn't something that just a few people should be getting. Everybody should be getting it. And we need to, as a global society, I think, step back and think, what do people need? And we need to make sure that everybody has access to it, not just a chosen small group of people. This can be done in many different ways, depending on context, economics, etc., but includes things like cash and tax transfers, economic support that is family-based, not individually based, uh, gender equality initiatives, initiatives, and better child and social services. So, in order to support and strengthen families, we need to have prevention, we need collaboration, we need education, and we need communication. And I'm just going to end with this thought that we need to recognize and support the family as the unit, which is still a central, if not the central feature of most people's lives, both in other parts of the world and the West. And I'm going to stop here because this was a lot of information and I apologize about that and I shall open it up. That was great though. Thank, Bahira, thanks for giving us some, some uh, broad context. Um, it was really helpful to inform the dialogue. We're gonna have two families speak briefly. Um, I think Debjani is on the call, uh, uh, but I'm not sure, but if uh, I'll, I'll look around. But first, um, Joseph Tolles is joining us from Alabama in the United States. Um, and he is with one of his seven, soon to be eight sons, and he'll explain briefly. But Joseph, I'm gonna try to limit you in the interest of time because uh, to, to like five minutes, right? So, uh, or even less if you can. Um, that would be that would be great. Joseph, go ahead. Oh, we need to, okay. yeah, there you are. Then you can hear me. Um, well, I wanted to pull up a uh, share screen. Oh, hold on one sec. Yes, share screen. And this. Wait. I'm sorry, it's taking me. Um, Okay. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Um, Bahira, you're going to have a field. You would have a field day with me because you talked about so many things that are so important to me and my family. Um, this is a slide of of my family. Uh, there are seven seven different boys, um, and my family certainly is not shrinking. Um, they, you can see that we. Well, I guess some of us look alike, but we've different shapes, sizes, um, different ethnicities. The reason that is, is because uh, my, my family ambassadorship uh, started because I went out and created my own family for many of the reasons that Bahira was talking about. Um, I grew up in foster care. So my beginnings in this world were as a foster child and I was born and raised in foster care. 
for my entire life and aged out at the age of, of uh, 21. Uh, in the United States, at any given time, there are 400,000 children living in the foster care system. Each year, 20,000 young people will age out of the system without a family. 50% of those who age out will experience homelessness, incarceration, and all will be more likely to experience unemployment, unplanned pregnancy, legal system involvement, substance abuse, and a lack of basic care, healthcare services. This is my beginnings of my family. My mother and father, and you, there's lots of disconnections there. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go very quickly then. <laughs> Uh, there's lots of disconnections which got me into foster care. My mother was 15 years old when she had me, uh, which was not the norm, um, and my father was 16. And they were of different races. I grew up in a much larger family where there were six children, and I call them core children. Um, my parents who raised me had two, uh, two children biologically, and the rest of us were in foster care. And if you can look very quickly, a lot of my brothers uh, that I grew up with have not lived um, due to a lot of the issues that Bahira was talking about. The family experienced divorce, mental illness, and alcoholism. But this is what I created. Get this. These are a picture of one of every one of my kids who came to me at different ages. So the first one came to me at the age of 18. That's when I adopted him. The second one was 13. And we're going across. The third one was 13 as well. The one on the, the first one on the left on the bottom was 14 years old when he adopted him. 18 years old when, no, no, 19 years old when the one with the tuxedo came to me. 14 was the one with the baby. And the one on the bottom right, or my bottom right at least, was two weeks from his 21st birthday when I adopted him. Soon I will be welcoming a, a 16 year old from a different state coming into my home. Um, so we will be then a family of, of eight children. Uh, and my whole focus is to take all the things that Bahira talked about, all the obstacles, all of the, the, the uh, I mean, my kids came from different places. They, some came with medication, family histories that you wouldn't want to listen to because they would be so upsetting. But my whole goal has been to grow out of your constrictions. So this picture really depicts sort of the base basis of how I'd like to raise my kids, whatever is going on, whatever you've come into our family with, you can grow through it. Um, and I found that picture and I thought it was a great um, sort of demonstration of, of how I feel about family. Um, I, you know, I stay very positive with my kids. And so um, human beings are like tea bags. You don't know how strong they can be until they're into hot water. Um, so the other thing that I really work with my kids at is um, embracing the struggles, owning the struggles and overcoming the struggles. Um, and the, the, the most important is that I want my kids to stand strong like a mountain but they have to flow like water because life has been difficult. Life will be difficult and we face challenges every day. So um, another image. Paul, I don't know how much time <laughs> you want me to do. You, you, you're actually, you're out of time, um, but, but, um, but I think if, if you can actually stop sharing your screen and then we'll, we'll, that'll allow us to, to open up the dialogue. But um, uh, I, there's a reason why I, I, I invited um, Joseph uh, to, um, to, to talk with us. 
because to me in answering this question, and this is gonna get us back to um, this series of questions because we're now gonna enter into the open dialogue because I don't believe that Deb Johnny is with us, by the way. Um, Deb Johnny is, uh, doesn't seem to be with us. And it's in some sense good because I wanna give us more time uh, that'll allow us more time for dialogue. Um, but one of the reasons I had Joe talk with us is to give a sense of, to me, that's individualism at its best, right? Here's a man who could have just led a life on his own um, and had a good time. And he decided to form a family of his own. He crafted that family and he's still, <laughs> he's still building that family. And so it gives us a model among many models out there of what caring families might look like in the future. And Lord knows if, the, if, if there are, are kids out there who are in foster care system in the United States, there are plenty of other kids in war-torn countries, especially who are in need of, of caring families, right? So, so Joe is in some sense kind of a model to me, uh, and, and I can't help but get to some extent emotional when I hear him uh, talk and talk about his family, but there's a lot you can learn about um, Joe. And in fact, Joe, I would recommend if you would like share some of the information in the in the chat, which we will share with everybody um, uh, after to to the a broader audience um, uh, about your family and some of the details. Some of the videos that you've shown me would be really awesome. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen just briefly to show you some questions and um, to allow you to um, uh, think. And these are open questions um, for, um, uh, for the dialogue. First is, what struck you about what we said and any connections that you see to your own family experience? Second is, what concerns and uh, do you and your family have about your own family's safety and health and how that might relate to these trends happening in the world. And what do you see as the future of families? Are you positive or are you, uh, are you pessimistic about what's gonna happen to families in the future? Okay, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing so that everybody can, um, can, and now it's basically open dialogue time. If you could, I would greatly appreciate if you would use the hand raise. I'm gonna show you how to use the hand raise sim symbol. Um, uh, I just put it up for mine. Um, if you could use that in order to uh, um, to talk, that would be great. And I will, will go in order as much as possible, as best as we can, in order of those people who raise their hands. Who wants to go first? The first and the second page are somewhat more or less the same. Yeah, sure. um, <laughs> uh, Marvin, did you? Marvin, go ahead. Mar yeah. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Marvin. When I was uh, listening to um, the professor's uh, presentation, she was talking about in the individualism is increasing in the world, like because of you know, both of the parents are pursuing their own happiness, their own goal of life. They may end up with divorce. That's has been happening around me, like my friend, like for my age, I'm in my early thirties. Many of my friends, they got, they got married maybe like two or three years ago, but many of them have been divorced or in the process of divorcing. So I didn't know it's a world trend until this meeting. I didn't know, I feel like maybe more because of what is like in China, because Chinese economy is developing so fast, people are getting different kind of job opportunities, try to maybe make more money, have better job opportunities, or even have, uh, you know, some uh, other romantic relationship, they choose to end their marriage. But now from this meeting, I learned it's a world trend. People are pursuing their own happiness. And this is the kind of, uh, I mean, like the professor said, it can be good or bad, good for the individual, but maybe better for the family. However, you know, that's what's happening to me. From this meeting, I learned better about the world trend. Thank you. Thanks, Marvin. Um, oh, we've comment? got, yes. Yeah, I just yeah. want to make a very fast comment. 
in the late 90s, there was a type of marriage introduced in Louisiana called covenant marriage. Mm -hmm. And the idea was to make divorce more difficult. And the only way you could get it, so when you married, you married. And the only way to get a divorce was in case there was abuse. Guess what? It's 2021. Nobody's even heard of covenant marriage anymore. That tells us something. People want the option to get out of their marriages if they are not happy. And this is happening around the world. And the second thing I want to say is there's a lot of research that shows it's not divorce that is bad for children. It is conflict between the adults that is bad for the children. So when people stay together and fight the whole time, that does nothing for the children. If they divorce and they have an amiable relationship and learn how to co-parent, that is much better for the children. Um, we've got uh, data, Robert. Um, I don't know where you're from, but if you could speak and identify what city and country you're you're call you're um, you're from. I don't know if data. Okay, Robert. thank you. Um, I'm I'm called Data Robert Festo. I'm here in Uganda. Uh, Kampala is our city, and our city, our small city, our capital city is Kampala, and the, the small city is Arua. So we are here as refugees in Uganda. So what strike me most is about to the, the family life that at times during war or a zone period, you find that your family will not get that kind of love that you used to exercise at first in your families. So we are really finding that uh, most of the families during war time they live on trauma. So they cannot exercise that intimate, intimate love that they started at first. So uh, most people run away from responsibility because they know that now in the period where they are, they cannot even able to support uh, even their, their, their close relatives because you are in the same situation uh, with the, your, 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 your grandfather, you, are, you have the same situation with your grandmother. So you cannot even have a support. Now coming into marriage, you find that marriage system, uh, like a, let me take, for example, I'll be talking into our levels as the, uh, in the refugee settings uh, here in Uganda. You find people will do uh, marriage because what you know is that you have to only be uh, having small family and so that you are able to uh, support uh, the, 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 the nuclear family that you have. And at times you find even supporting your relatives becomes so hard. And this is making kind of love that you have at first with your parents is depreciating. So at uh, level in times of uh, the areas of conflict uh, uh, zones, they vary with other places where you find like this is a bit of peace or stability. So uh, we are seeing that it is really a very good uh, initiative. I like the idea of how you, I learned a lot. I learned from even this family diplomacy right from the time when I was following it from the Facebook. It has changed and transformed my life as a, a refugee. I'm able to learn. So thank you. So for advice, I'll get more from, I need more facilitators to help me and uh, at least so that I will also educate more of our youths, most of our families, because there are a lot of violences in the refugee settings because people, they don't need now responsibility. They want to run away from responsibility because they are not able to really know that a family should really be sustainable and they should also know that even if little they have, they have to support their families in difficult time. So thank you. I love this idea. Please, next time, don't leave me out. I'll be together with you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Robert. Um, we've got Elizabeth, then Joseph, then Aaron. Elizabeth? Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to um, give a shout out to our um, presenter today for mentioning that can Elizabeth, you if you could just quickly introduce where you are in the Sorry. world. For Not sure, to... okay. Yeah. yeah, so I'm in Washington, DC, the capital of the US. And um, is that enough? Yep. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an intern for Learning Life. So um, 
yeah, I just wanted to give a shout out to our presenter today for talking about how um, the idea of, of marriage has changed and that it's it's not true that people are 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 seeking to um, or or, or the, it's not true that the trend is um, away from or away from the idea of marriage that no people are beginning to not support the idea of marriage but that the quality of marriage um, is has become more important and I think what um, data Robert was saying about that the family needs to be sustainable um, and you know, the family unit needs to be stronger. That's the way to secure those things. Marriage should not be a sense of obligation to any particular individual in the marriage. Um, like, you know, women should be able to have the right to have a say in, in, in what goes on. And if they are experiencing abuse or any kind of dissatisfaction, that makes them feel that their lives are their lives, the quality of their personal life at, or their children um, is at risk due to the marriage that they are in, then they should have the right to, to, to exit that situation in order to pursue a healthier one. Um, and I really appreciate that um, Bahira made such a big deal about this because, um, you know, I also grew up in foster care, as I mentioned in the chat. And um, I sought out a new family later in life. Um, and both of my new, you know, adoptive, as you would say, parents um, experienced divorce. And they met each other after both, you know, separately divorced their first uh, spouses. And they are now a very happy and healthy couple and a, a very happy and healthy family. Um, and it doesn't matter what type of people uh, constitute that marriage either, you know, um, it's just about safe, safety, psychological and physical, um, healthy and sustainable, and to have the freedom to decide what constitutes your marriage, I think is critical to creating that kind of environment. Great. Um, Joseph, and then Aaron. Yeah. Um, I, I'm 62 years old and there's so much noise in the world at, around marriage and uh, money and finances. I did not become a father until I was 49, until I was able to reconcile like my social and individual identity and not be burdened by societal norms was I able to think I clearly was born to be a father. I wasn't born to be a husband. Mm -hmm. So until that time came that I was able to get through all of the noise, I was stuck and unhappy. And so now I'm able to expand my family and bring other people in and, and even teach about relationships and individual strengths and, and um, without the burden of thinking that something's off, something's wrong. So, you know, I do understand that our situation is very, very uh, unusual. Um, you know, adoption is not, maybe not so unusual, but it's very unusual for a single male who grew up in foster care to do this but it was all the noise that prevented me. So I think forums like this, where we talk about this stuff and educate and learn about the definition of marriage, the definition of relationships um, is very helpful for all of us to move forward and respect it and respect people's choices and how they do things, you know, cause listen, there are places in this world and even in this country and probably people that I know that think, oh, single man, he shouldn't be raising kids by himself. Um, and clearly it's not an issue for us, is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I just wanted to put that out there. I think all of this stuff is so, so very interesting and I like 
like really digging in, but it's only until we're able to dig in and get through our stuff and societal stuff before we can make a movement. Um, so everybody go out and adopt. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, Joseph. Um, Aaron, then Chirunim, then Anna. Thank you very much. I'm calling from Ghana. That is West Africa. And I want to talk about the future of family. Um, Aaron, Aaron, just while you while you are talking, you may want to turn off your video, um, and that will allow you to speak. I think without as much interference. Okay. So can I be here now? It's it, it's going to get better. It just there's a delay. I think. Oh. The future, the future of family, the future of family. I think this this is a, a very good intervention. The learning life came at the right time over here in Ghana and specifically West Africa. The concept of family seems losing the ground. When you go to the high courts that administer marriages, the percentage to marriage to divorce, divorces, are on the high side. And it appears the purpose for which people marry are no more for the purpose of family, but for some different, maybe to satisfy religious, you know, curiosity and other things. So with this concept, there is a lot to learn. And I think it has come at the right time. I stand to learn a lot from people on this platform. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Um, Chirunim. Yeah, greetings everyone. This is Chirunim from Nigeria. Yeah, I am with my brother and um, really interesting conversation I must say. And um, I really want to contribute about some, some particular trends that has Changed over the years um, as a of family in Nigeria. Because um, right now, people do not get um, married. Marriages are not happening as, as much as it, it used to, so, um, mostly because of um, the cost of running a family and also because of the um, cost of marriage rights. So, um, mar getting married is, is quite very expensive right, right now in, in Nigeria because. Most um, families see marriages as a um, a form to um, extort money from from their in-laws or from their yeah. So they try to just put in a lot of a lot of bills as as much as possible. And um, for young men who are who are trying to just get their feet on on with life, and then you're having a long list of of things to to um to get down before getting married, it's quite expensive. So do not do not want to do that. And um, another one is um, um, basically, what is Go ahead and cheat then, Okay, um, so another um, trend here in Nigeria is about kids, about most, most children we have, um, we have a, a little bit of um, division between um, poorer families and well-to-do families. So we have more kids with, with poorer families and then lesser kids with well-to-do <clears throat> families. And it's it's kind of it's still difficult to understand because it's supposed to be the richer families who are supposed to have more kids because they can actually raise these kids well. But um, poorer families, they because they do not have much to do, they see um they see giving birth as the only form of um, recreation yeah so they just go on and go on and go on and then you see a man who um, is not able to feed his family having up to 10 or 14 kids and and then you just see them going to the street and, and beg and all of that yeah. mm -hmm. so th this is kind of the trend and basically here also people all right um, good evening, everyone. This is Adio Tuetoma. I'm from Nigeria, and um, I'm going to speak about um, some of the trends on the high rate of divorce. So it comes from, I think it comes from people marrying from the, for the wrong reasons, actually. 
a lot of people see marriage as getting married to a well to the wealthy person as an escape from poverty. So they don't actually marry out of love or likeness for the person. So they marry as an they marry as an escape from poverty, led to a divorce and hired of cheating and infidelity in marriages. And it's a, it's a very high trend in Nigeria. It happens a lot where um, people get married and they go for DNA tests and find out that like um, let's say nine percent of their kids are not actually theirs. And it is a, is a very bad trend in Nigeria at the moment, and it's um, responsible for the high rate of divorce in Nigeria at the moment. And like my brother said about, um, talked about the high um, cost of getting married in Nigeria, you have to pay a lot of ma uh, marriage rights to the next family or your in-laws before you get married to um, your bride or something like that. Before you get married, you pay a lot of marriage rights, um, you fulfill some promises. Going on with the cost is, is, um, is actually expensive. So a lot of people are actually single. They are ready to get married, but because of the costs of starting a family or raising a family, they are actually single or are just in um, platonic relationships and all that. So there, there's a um, there's a higher of divorce and, and a higher of like single people in Nigeria at the moment. Um, so that's yeah. it. Great. Um, it's good to hear your perspective. I, I, I found it particularly interesting, I think, Chirunim, when you mentioned this paradox, right? You would expect, right, wealthy families would be the ones that have more kids because they can afford it. But in fact, the pattern is just the opposite. It, it's poor people who have more kids and rich people who have fewer kids. But I think it has to do in part with the rising when you have more when you have when you're wealthier, you have more expectations for your kids. You want them to get a good education. You want them to be established. It takes longer for that to happen. So it's more expensive. And the expectations, I think, as Bahida was mentioning, are much higher for happiness, for success, et cetera, and so forth at higher levels. Um, uh, anyway, so. Uh, we have uh, Ana Espinosa from uh, Mexico, then Aisha from Pakistan, and Trisha from I don't know where, but um, that's the order. Uh, Ana Espinosa. Yeah. Hi, we are from Mexico, as Paul said. Uh, we are specific specifically from Puebla. Um, uh, an issue that we believe that is very important here in Mexico is that a uh, change in the vision of our social programs has, has to be made because the government gives some types of programs per, but um, they give you money in relation of how many children you have. So the poor people are having more and more children in order to have more and more money and they are not working to uh, give their families a better, um, a better income, a better life. So the, the consequence you have is that uh, we have a lot of poor children in our country because of this vision of the programs. And we also um, view that a problem that has become very important because of the pandemic is that we have a lack of social programs directed to our middle class because of the crisis that the pandemic um, developed, a lot of of families that uh, belongs to the middle class now are um, now are belong to poor cla poor class because they don't have well they lose their jobs because of the crisis and that is all thank you great thanks thanks Anna Aisha from Pakistan but actually living in Turkey in Turkey yeah <laughs> hi everyone it's nice to meet all of you people I just want to say I agree with Maria like uh, the people in Pakistan, especially, we get married because our family says it. Mm -hmm. And there is, uh, the divorce is a stigma. Even if you have an abusive partner, you have abusive parents, you can't leave the house. Like for example, in Americans, uh, in America, in Canada, after uh, you're 18, you can leave your house. But if, like I'm 34, I'm still living with my parents. And whenever I say to my mom that can I move out? She was like, no, it's a big no. Like before marriage, how is it possible? What the people will say? You know, so these things we are facing, uh, my, I'm still single because of the quality of marriage partner. 
I don't want to get married because I can afford it. I'm on a good post. So why should I marry uh, someone just for the money or for kids? I can adopt or I can earn well. So I need the partner for the companionship. So that's, yes, the quality goes. But when I see, because I'm a teacher, so when I see the kids come to me and they say they have abusive parents, I can't do anything. When the women, because I do the social work too, when the women came and they say that we have the abusive partner, I can't do anything. Because when I say divorce, they say, oh, if I will get divorced, I can't go to my parents' house because they will not accept me. The society will not accept me. So what happened? They will stay in that marriage. Then the whole next generation, they get the abusive parents because they see the conflict between the parents. Then the whole generation it goes down. And then um, when people do the, because we still have arranged marriages, unfortunately. So the result of the arranged marriages is that the women are not able to conceive because of the family pressure, because maybe they don't like the partners. So you guys are talking about the divorce. I am in favor of the divorce uh, because in my part of the world, divorce is a big word. Like it's a forbidden word. You can't do it. And if you have to do it, if you can um, have to convince your parents or you will think of about the society, unfortunately. And this is going really high. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Aisha, that's really helpful. Um, Trisha, and I believe you're from, uh, from Virginia in the United States. I am, and it's, uh, I am in the car right now, and I am told to close mask to have one of so Ah, um, Trisha, I think... My son. Yes. Um, uh, Matthew, um, I think because we're, we're having and trouble, you might want to meet her, meet her and go on to Marcy and then just ask her to fill in the, um, fill in the, um, fill in the, uh, the Zoom chat. She can, she can explain in the Zoom chat, but as long as she's driving, she probably can't, she can't communicate. Um, uh, Marcy from, uh, from Brazil. Um, you can mute, mute her, Matthew. Go ahead and mute Trisha. Yeah, I did. Oh, that's weird. Um, for some reason, yeah, she's okay. I think she's. I think she, it's it's fixed. Um, go ahead. Go or maybe not. We'll we'll find out. Um, uh, Marcy, go ahead. Okay, uh, so I'm Marcy, I'm from Brazil, I'm Brazilian, and this is my husband, Almir, he's also Brazilian, and we speak from Italy, and we are both born and raised here in Joinville. So, um, I can relate to a lot of what was said. Uh, for example, Anna talked about the financial support that the government um gives to families and we had this uh problem also in brazil uh it's a little bit more stabilized now but a few years ago we had this paradoxical problem also because people were wanting to have more children to get more financial support and i know about some families that wouldn't work wouldn't go uh wouldn't uh search for some kind of improvement to get freed from this uh dependence this financial dependence and this was a big problem but now it's it's a lot uh it's a bit more stabilized. And uh, I, I come from a family from, for, of eight children. So I am the youngest child of eight children. It's not so common in Brazil. We are indeed a big family, but I can, uh, uh, I can relate to what was said about poor 
families having more children. It's a reality, also in Brazil. Uh, it's uh, changing a little bit now because we have indeed families uh, with um, better financial condition, uh, having more children, having three or four children sometimes, but uh, it's indeed more common for poorer families. And in my case, uh, I, I come from a very poor family. Uh, my uh, father and my mother had uh, studied only four years at school. So it's, uh, it's not even the, the basics of the, the schooling. So, and I, I have, I having my master degree. So yes, indeed, when you uh, want more for your family, the trend is to think a little bit more about what will you do to do it, to get it for your children. So we have only two kids, two sons, in order to give a better condition, for example, better school for them, because the public system is not that good in Brazil right now. I am a teacher at public school, but my children are not in the public system. So it's, it's very complicated. I would like to have more children indeed. We would like to have at least three children. It was our plan, yeah. But it wasn't possible. We couldn't because we had our house to pay. We have the school to pay and we, we can't. So it's our limit. So it's very complicated. So, and I came from a big family. So I'd like to have a big family because I think it's good. I like it, but yeah, that's uh, uh, yeah. And about divorce, just uh, another thing. My mom, my parents are divorced, and so I can relate to this struggle about being divorced because 30 years ago, when my mother decided to get divorced, so uh, she struggled a lot because there was a taboo about it, about divorced women, about children from um, from of divorced women, so. Uh, she herself would say, oh, no, that kid there, I don't, I don't want you to be friends with those kids because they are from a divorced mother. So she herself would say that. And later, she got divorced and she struggled a lot because this taboo was very strong 30 years ago. Now it's not. Now it's very common and uh, we are indeed in this trend, in this global trend uh, about families. Thank you. Really interesting. And, and, and you guys reflect to some extent these broader trends, more education in the younger generations, fewer children. You guys went from eight to two kids, at least in your, uh, your family. It's really interesting. Um, so we have time for just a couple more. Um, so Lania Jamal from, I don't know where, but if you can introduce yourself and then actually uh, um, uh, Kieran here in the United States um, is gonna um, give a, a child's perspective. Um, so um, so Lania, Lania first. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm really happy to have you here and learning and listening a lot of uh, information from people in different background and in different culture and different country. Is this me, Lania Jamal from uh, Iraq? I was in US, but uh, originally I was born in Iraq and right now I am in Iraq. Iraq is a Muslim country and have a lot of conflict war a lot of things. That's why we have a lot of problem in a uh, family issue, in marriage issue. I, I would like to share some, um, like some gaps, some challenge in here, uh, because I already work in the GBV gender-based violence uh, project in the international uh, organization. Every day I'll uh, see the new cases from the domestic violence, early marriage, uh, forced marriage, and everything like that. That's why uh, we have a lot of uh, problem like that. And every day, uh, the divorce data will be higher and higher because uh, people going 
to uh, make marriage here uh, just for some reason. And one of the reasons the family issue and the family forced them to uh, marriage because people from here have a lots of uh, Muslim background. They cannot practice sex without uh, legal marriage. That's why they just would like to complete the, and support each other for se sexual need and also for financial uh, support because in here, in our culture, uh, men can support the woman and also can all the financial support for the family, like uh, house rent, uh, daily uh, service, everything. That's why uh, women uh, or girl uh, wish to marry for with someone just for supporting uh, herself uh, from the final uh, financial uh, situation. Uh, that's why uh, we don't have uh, some healthy family uh, and every day they, they get a lot of problem and they get uh, divorced. Uh, I'm really so sad for that, but uh, the marriage situation here in our country, uh, it's really uh, get uh, so bad <laughs> every day, day by day. I would like to uh, get some information from your experience, the friends' experience to suggest for the young people here and awareness them, uh, raising awareness them uh, to get married by um, her uh, choice or his choice, not by forcing family because uh, we need that uh, style for getting married. Thank you for everything. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Great. It's great to hear from so many different people from so many different countries. Um, it's really interesting to hear your different perspectives. I think it sounds like one of the themes of this is in part that divorce can be actually good, right? This is something that Aisha was saying and, and Lanya to some extent, it seems like you're saying is divorce is actually good because it may reduce domestic violence. Um, um, so I just wanna, because we do have some kids in on this conversation, um, I do want to get some uh, uh, input from actually Kieran, um, who is uh, 17 years old, a high school student here in the United States, and then we're going to close it off there. I, I'm sure a number of you and Nicole included um, would uh, I appreciate the fact that you would like to contribute, but I also want to respect your time. Um, we are at the 130 mark and we're a little past it. Um, so I'll finish with a, a couple of concluding remarks and then just give you a, a sense of, uh, remind you of a sense of what's ahead. So Kieran. Uh, all right, hi, I'm Kieran, like Paul said. Uh, we're in North Carolina right now in more the Southern part of the United States, but we are from the Washington DC area. Um, and I can relate a bit to the piece about um, families shrinking because especially in the African-American community, I know some of the familial situations and um, you know amount of kids people have varies for both like where you're the region you're in and uh, cultural circumstances. Um, but in the African-American community, it also seems like the family sizes have been uh, decreasing. Like I said, or not like I said, but my great, uh, I'm pretty sure my great grandmother, um, it seems like the amount of kids that they've had have been decreasing. Um, she had a lot and um, my grandma had, how much did grandma have? Just me. So grandma just had, so yeah, <laughs> next generation, grandma just had my mom. And so mom has me and my sister, who's a few feet away from me. So it seems like the family sizes are uh, decreasing. That's something I can relate to. I found interesting uh, in this presentation that I didn't really think about before. Um, and the piece about divorce, um, I don't have too much to say about it, but I feel like um, I feel like it can be both helpful and hurtful uh, to uh, escape like abuse uh, from partners is definitely one of the helpful aspects of divorce. But I feel like it can also be very stressful for um, the kids and they can grow up, even if it is a healthy divorce for um, the parent, if they don't immediately find like another sustainable, not as a immediately find a sustainable partner, but are first of all in a sustainable situation financially and um, you know stuff like that. 
it can be a really stressful uh, environment for kids to grow up in and can uh, either discourage them from getting married or maybe encourage them to uh, do better uh, in their marriage, uh, depending on how they feel. Um, so those are just two of the things that I found pretty interesting in this presentation and that I related to. Um, and that's all I have to say. Oh, awesome. Um, so I want to thank everybody um, uh, for participating. Um, this has been really interesting. I'm also particularly glad the, the fact that a, we're coming from different countries this time around, uh, as opposed to last year. There are more uh, people in partner pairs, or and I, I know some of you are friends and uh, um, housemates and so on. But it's we also have more families participating. Um, I'll reiterate that that's really important for not only conveying what we're trying to do is to convey that this is family diplomacy, and one of the first steps for family diplomacy is families talking to each other across borders. Um, uh, so, so really appreciate um, the family in particular showing up. Uh, and so I just want to remind you that the next dialogue um, is going to focus actually on healthcare systems. Um, so we will have a, 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 some speakers who are health professionals talk about healthcare systems and talk about family health across the world. Um, and each of the dialogues will have a, a different focus. Um, and the next dialogue is on July 25th. All of the dialogues are on Sundays uh, at the same time with the same Zoom link. But uh, the next dialogue will be on July 25th. Um, thank you all for participating. This will be, I want to remind you that this will be, uh, this is video recorded. We are going to share the video recording with people and we're going to share photos from this dialogue um, with, uh, with everyone. So really appreciate your participation and look forward to seeing you at the next dialogue. All right, everybody. Bye.